Dear students, dear guests, welcome to our joint seminar, Peace and Conflict at Global Level, Contemporary Issues. This course is a partnership between the Global Awareness Education at the University of Tübingen in Germany and the Federal University of ABC, Brazil. In this course, we discuss the contemporary tools to conflict management, resolution, and transformation used to promote peace, discussing concrete cases and different perspectives from around the world. We will have guests from different countries and contexts. We will contribute with different lectures. In both universities, the course is offered to students from different disciplines, including in as part of the Global Awareness Education and the Transdisciplinary Course Program, as a free extension course at the Federal University of ABC. The course organizers are Professor Gilberto Rodriguez in Brazil, Hassan Tahiro and me, Nossa Perez da Silva at the University of Tübingen. Today, we will hear a lecture on political conflicts in Latin America with Professor Gilberto Rodriguez from Brazil. So I will introduce him for those that are not aware of his biography, although he's here a co-organizer of the course. Professor Gilberto Rodriguez is professor and head of the graduate program in international relations at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he's also a researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil. He coordinates the nucleus for the study of federalism and local government at Federal University of ABC. And his research interests include international organizations, global issues and local governments, international cooperation, paradiplomacy, and federative foreign policy. He's a member of the Advisory Board of Federal Governments. Elizabeth, we are very glad to hear a lecture of you in this, in this course. So thank you so much for uh, accepting the, the, the invitation also to be with us. Thank you very much, uh, Glaucia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with a different hat, because as you already mentioned, we, we share the coordination of the course, but today I will give a, you a class uh, regarding uh, political conflicts in Latin America. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Uh, so today uh, we would like to, to share with you some, um, some ideas, uh, some thoughts, um, and um, we began here with, uh, sorry, to put here in the, the first one here. Yeah, political conflicts in Latin America. Uh, this is an exciting issue, at least for me. I hope that you, you may enjoy together this reflection. And for, for that, I prepare a presentation that you have access afterwards. Uh, but uh, at this very moment, I would like to share those thoughts with you and also to receive uh, comments and questions after the presentation. I, I would be very glad to, to answer, if I can, uh, your, your comments and your questions. Let's begin with a very basic question. What is Latin America? And why I choose to begin with this basic question? Because um, despite the fact that most of you uh, come from Latin America, at least from the Federal University of ABC participants, uh, but I know that we are in a, an environment uh, session, uh, international environment session, so uh, I think it's important to do basic questions. And the other reason is why, bec because we as uh, scholars in a scientific environment, we should make basic questions. We should begin with basic questions. It's very important to do that. So what is Latin America? Part of a continent, as it fix it in, in, in the world maps, as you uh, already know, and it's very useful to see uh, the maps to identify where we are, where others are. 
a region with a historical cultural identity. We can talk about language, Spanish, Portuguese, also French in some countries, but mainly Spanish and Portuguese. Religion, uh, a set, very large set of religions we have in the region, but Catholic religion is uh, still very important in the region. Ethnicity, we have uh, a very different uh, kind of uh, different uh, ethnic, ethnic, uh, ethnicity and different groups, indigenous, autochthonous groups in the region, uh, native groups uh, still we have. And we have something that we can call Latinidad, which has to do with the, the Latin the origin, which is not solely, which is not the unique, but it's a very important part of our identity. We, Latin America is also a political region. Uh, in the UN, we have a, sp a special group called GRULAC, which is the group of Latin American countries and the Caribbean countries uh, that act together in many, many situations, and, but is treated together, uh, is treated as a group through the United Nations. Um, system. We are also, as Latin America region, an economic region. Then we, we have to mention the CEPAL, the Economic Commission for Latin America, with, with headquarters in Santiago in Chile, which is very famous for, the, for that, um, the developmentism. Uh, it's a theory that was uh, created and developed at CEPAL to explain how the developing countries were dependent to the North, to the global North. Um, we also have CELA, which is the system of uh, economic system for Latin America with headquarters in Caracas in Venezuela. We also can say that Latin America is a component of the South, the global South. Uh, it encompasses developing countries, it is part of the G77, which is much more than 77 today, but at, at the very beginning was 77 group uh, inside the UN, the General Assembly. It's part of the no aligned movement, not all the countries. Brazil, for instance, is not part of the no aligned movement. It's an observer, but many countries of Latin America are part of, of this movement. And the J20, which is more recent, and not all countries are part, but some of them, especially those uh, countries that are more developed like Chile, like Brazil, Mexico, and so on and so forth. It's important at this very beginning of our session also to mention that when we talk about Latin America, we also have to include the Caribbean. But why many times we don't say the Caribbean? together with Latin America, because the Caribbean include, includes countries that are not from Latin origin, like former UK and former Netherlands colonies, territories. territories. But it's important in many circumstances to consider that when you talk about Latin America, we are also talking about the Caribbean. Let's see the maps, because it, it's very important to identify the region in the maps. You can see uh, in the left side, a traditional map. It's a Mercator uh, projection. It's a traditional projection. It was conceived during the 60s by a German, um, well, maybe Glosser can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he is German, was German, uh, but I know that he was, he lived in German in Duisburg. Uh, Mercator, and this traditional projection show us Latin America as the, the, let's say, the classic view when we see a map. So we can see from Argentina and Chile, from the south uh, towards the north until Mexico. All this region, we, we can say that is Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and the Caribbean uh, Sea. But you can also see a different map, which is the Peters World 
projection, the Peter's projection, which is a different kind of map that show that show us uh, the uh, the countries with the um, normal size of of each country. Uh, in other words, the Mercator uh, projection used to favor uh, the global north in terms of perception of size of the countries. And the Peters projection, you can see, for instance, Brazil is much more, it's bigger than when you see in the Mercator's projection. I think it's important to show both maps because um, we are in a moment that we have to, um, to show the, that the global south has a, power, has a power and you have to empower the global south considering all the, including, including the conflicts that we are facing today. So the size of South America, the size of Latin America is bigger than we used to see in the traditional maps. That's the point that I'd like to make with you. Here we have South America. I, I now I will keep the traditional map, which is, is easy to find, um, easier to find. So we can see the, 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 the map of South America. Uh, Brazil is the biggest country, but you can see Argentina, you can see Chile in the South Cone, uh, how we call also the, this region, the Bolivia, the Andean, the Andean region, uh, including Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, part of Venezuela, then the Guiana Plateau uh, with uh, the French Guiana, Suriname, and Guiana, the, the, the former British Guiana. This is uh, uh, the South America, Uruguay and Paraguay also uh, in, the, in the South. Here we have Central America. Central America, for us who, who are in, in Brazil, and I will talk in a very personal uh, opinion, my personal opinion, uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't know much about Central America when we, we are in Brazil. Uh, uh, when we live in South America. It's, it's a little bit far region. Uh, we, many people in Brazil confuse uh, Costa Rica with Puerto Rico, for instance, there is a confusion. In my case, because I lived in Costa Rica for one year and a half, I, I did my master's degree in the University for Peace, I consider myself privileged because I know better the region including, I, I visit many of the, those countries. So what we call Central America is Panama, where there is the channel, very important channel uh, in terms of uh, international transportation. Then we have Costa Rica, then going from south to north, then we have Costa Rica, then Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Belize. Belize is, the, is very, uh, unknown country uh, because Belize we can also classify it as Central America but it, it is also a Caribbean country it, it's part of the, the Caribbean system so this is uh, Central America we, we do not include Mexico because despite the fact that there are a lot of identity between Central America and Mexico in terms of language, culture, food music Mexico is part of uh, North America. We know that there is a very discretionary way to classify the countries, but that's the way traditionally it has been classified. So Central America is uh, this map. Now we have the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean Sea and the Caribbean region. You can see that the Caribbean region is very fragmented because it's uh, most of the Caribbean countries are islands. Most of them are, are, are islands. The difficult thing is that uh, most of those islands are, uh, are linked to different uh, traditions, cultures, and languages. We, we have an Hispanic Caribbean encompass, that encompasses uh, Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic, the Hispanic Caribbean, we have a French Caribbean that encompasses Haiti, Dominica, Martinique. You can see the, the small islands uh, in, the, in the right side of the map. We also have a, a, some countries 
or territories, because not all are countries, independent countries, some are territories from European countries, still, like uh, Curaçao and Aruba, that are territories from, um, from the Netherlands. And uh, Cayman Islands is a territory from uh, belonging to UK. So this is the picture of the Caribbean. We also have Jamaica uh, from, from British, uh, uh, former British colony, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, they are all from a British uh, tradition. This is, so this is the Caribbean. And as I mentioned before, Belize, the country with, uh, which is in Central America is also part of the Caribbean system. Uh, because of uh, its tradition culture. The Caribbean culture is much, uh, let's say, much more wide than the physical geographic uh, map. We can include the Caribbean, we can include the part, the coast of Venezuela, we can include the coast of Colombia. Some uh, Caribbeanists, uh, people who study Caribbean, in, in also include the coast of Brazil uh, in Bahia as part of the Caribbean culture. So it's much more, is larger than we, we used to, to think that is. But geographically, and this is the point I'd like to make to you, the, geographically, the Caribbean Sea is in this map. And this is the, uh, when you talk about the Caribbean region, we are talking about those geographical, uh, geographic uh, countries inside this, this map. Okay, let's begin with a little, uh, some history because we cannot uh, understand countries today, contemporary countries, con contemporary um, conflicts today, if we do not understand a little bit of history. So we should uh, begin with history of the region. The Latin America before Europeans, were, before Europeans, the, the region, had uh, a lot of important and very well developed civilizations. Uh, there were uh, autochno autochthonous and native people there, ancient, rich, and complex cultures. We can mention the Mayas uh, in Mexico, in Central America. The Mayas were not already, uh, when the Spaniards arrived in, in, in the region, uh, the Mayas uh, were not uh, anymore there as a civilization. Of course, there, there, are, there, were, um, there were descendants of the Mayas, but as a civilization, the Mayas were not there anymore. Uh, but there are a lot of ruins, very important ruins in Honduras and, and Belize and Mexico and the part of uh, close to Cancun in the Yucatan Peninsula. We, you, you find a lot of Mayas uh, ruins, very rich culture. Uh, in Mexico, especially, we, we find Olmecas, Toltecas, and, and the Aztecas. The Aztecas were there when the Spaniards arrived. When Cortes arrived in, in Mexico, he found the Aztecas. The, the, the Aztecas was a huge civilization. They had a, a city, the Tenochtitlan, it was bigger than Madrid at that point. So we're talking about a very important culture at, 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 uh, in the beginning of the, of the, uh, the conquest uh, from the Europeans. And the Incas in all over Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, and we'll find Incas, which, which was also a very important and very well-developed civilization in South America. Contemporary, we have diverse indigenous peoples all over the region. More or less diversity, depending on the country. And I will mention some of those uh, uh, native uh, groups and groups and languages and uh, ethnic groups. We can mention the Aymara in Bolivia, the Quechua, which are uh, in Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, the Mapuche in Chile, and the Guarani in Paraguay and Brazil. In Brazil, we call Tupi Guarani, but they are also Guarani without the Tupi, which is uh, we used to classify through the language 
not only to ethnicity. And only to mention to you in terms of uh, the diversity that we have in Brazil, Brazil has 305 different ethnic groups. In, in general, they uh, speak different language. So we have still a very rich picture of diversity in the region. But when we see the, the occupation or the conquest, the European conquest, and if we begin in, in 1492 with the Christopher Columbus and Americo Vespucci uh, trip from, from Spain to Americas, uh, they, they did the trip in the name of the kingdom of Spain. They were traveling with a mission, with a state mission given by the, the kingdom of Spain, uh, a, a, a mission to occupy a mission to conquest. And um, in this mission, which, which was a state mission, we, we, we also have to mention the role of the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church at that point legitimized the Iberian conquest over territory and over people. There was a bula, bula was a, a document, a norm that uh, the popes, uh, used to issue until today, the Bula Inter Cetera in 1493, uh, this Bula divided the world between Portugal and Spain because they were the Catholic kings. Uh, and based on this Bula Inter Cetera, Portuguese, Portugal and Spain uh, issued the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Tordesillas Treaty in 1494, one year after the Bula Intercetera. This treaty divided uh, through the international law, the world between Portugal and Spain, the new world, the so-called new world. Of course, that other countries like France and, and the UK uh, didn't follow <laughs> the, this, that division. They were not uh, in, in favor of that division, including there is a I, I uh, su supposedly the, the the king Henry VI, the sixth, uh, he, he said supposedly he said that the Bible did not mention that the world wa was divided between Portugal and Spain. So we know that through uh, dif in different moments, the Britons, the the French, the uh, the Dutch did not follow what Portugal and Spain decided between themselves. But the important thing is that at the very moment of the conquest, the beginning of the conquest, Portugal and Spain had an important role uh, approaching Latin America. Uh, and one thing that I, I, I consider very important to mention to you is that at the very beginning of the conquest emerged in a moral debate, an ethical debate that is part of our debate until today. In, in, in mutatis mutantes, if you if you allow me the Latin expression, uh, with the differences that we have today, but uh, the Valladolid controversy, the Valladolid controversy between 1550 and 1551, between the uh, Bartolomé de las Casas, the priest, Bartolomé de las Casas, versus another priest called Sepulveda uh, is, it was very important uh, to manage the conquest in terms of respecting more or less human rights of native people there. Bartolome de las Casas, which is very well known, uh, uh, he, he was a priest in Mexico. He defended that the indigenous peoples have so. For us, of course, that is, is uh, if, if we consider that to have or not so was a matter of dignity at that time, it's a matter of protecting in terms of human rights, of course that they had a soul um, uh, in equal conditions that other people had. But that was not at that point uh, an obvious thing. And Sepulveda defended the opposite. Sepulveda says, that indigenous have no soul. Uh, therefore, they could be treated as objects. They could be slavered and treated as objects. You know, you can, you can 
realize that this debate was very important, very uh, uh, caused a, a huge impact on, on how uh, the conquests were treating the native. Of course, that Bartolomé de las Casas did not prevail uh, automatically and at, at that period. It was a struggle between the two perceptions. Uh, but then the Catholic Church with the developing of the conquest uh, became to absorb much more the, the Bartolomé de las Casas uh, thesis uh, in comparison to uh, Sepúlveda one. But we, we, we are talking about the beginning of the conquest. And then finally, I would like to quote a, a Portuguese, Pedro de Magalhães Gandavo, which in, in a work uh, of 1573, he, uh, he assured that uh, the natives there in Brazil were a people without faith, law, and king. So, the Portuguese were allowed to impose the faith, to impose the law, and to impose the king. Because under his perception, and he was very important, this, this work of Pedro de Magalhães Gandavo was very important to disseminate ideas at that point, uh, was, uh, let's say, a authorization to impose a culture, to impose uh, a cosmovision at that point. Let's follow this the next session. Okay. So Latin America was invaded, was conquested, was colonized. And I just want to show you uh, this, those murals of Diego Rivera, which is, uh, who was a very important artist, Mexican artist, uh, we can find huge murals that he painted in Mexico, uh, especially in Mexico City, the, the federal district. Uh, there is a palace in the Zocalo, is the, the main square in, in the Mexico City, where we can find those huge murals that he tried to, uh, there is a narrative of the conquest through these murals. So the murals is, are very, Illustrative. So in the, in the left side, you can see the conquest, the Spaniards, slavery, indigenous peoples there. And in the right side, you can see the huge Teotihuacan, the capital of the Azteca capital at that point, which was, of course, as we know, uh, destroyed by the Spaniards. Another thing very important to mention at this point, slavery persons uh, from Africa to Latin America and the Caribbean. Then you can see with the flags, the different colors uh, means different uh, directions of uh, origins and directions of the uh, people slavered in Africa brought forcibly to other regions in Latin America and also the US, uh, as we, we already know, um, many, many slavered people from Africa were forced to be uh, transported to, to Latin America and North America too. But in our case, it's important to, to see Latin America, which all the Latin American region uh, received slavered people. We are talking about thousands of, thousands of millions of people slavered forcibly during centuries. So this is also part, it's a very important part of the culture, of the music, of the food, of the mindset of Latin America. Here, I would like to very, in a, in a very modest action, I would like to, uh, to say to you that understanding Latin America is not only a matter of social sciences and humanities. We can learn a lot uh, for uh, from the region, reading the literature, especially the literature that uh, of some authors, and I am offering you two examples that are very well known in the region. One is Eduardo Galeano in the left side, the Open Veins of Latin America is a classic. 
uh, Eduardo Galeano wrote this book during the 70s and during many years, uh, many decades, the, the book still today is a reference to understand the level of exploitation that Latin America suffered uh, beginning at the conquest until today. Uh, this, is, this book is in, in English. This is, a, is an English version. And the other author, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, also very well known, Colombian uh, author, uh, in his book, 100 Years of Solitude. Both authors uh, have uh, a lot of important um, uh, books. Uh, they are novelists. Uh, well, maybe more Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, Eduardo Galeano was a journalist. Both were journalists, but Galeano was were less fictionists and, and, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez were, was more a fictionist. And also Marquez was one uh, of the most important representatives of uh, a trend in the Latin American literature called uh, fantastic realism. In this book, 100 Years of Solitude is one of the, his main uh, works regarding the uh, fantastic realism. And so there are a lot of uh, different uh, authors. Uh, I'm only showing you, showing you two of them as a, a suggestion for if you, you don't know these books, I, I recommend that you, you read at some point. But there are, of course, a lot of uh, Latin American literature that, and you can learn a lot uh, from the region through literature. Okay. Now, I would like to show you some dates regarding the independence and the decolonization process or period in Latin America. And one thing that I'd like to stress uh, to you when we see this, uh, this slide with these dates is that many countries in Latin America were able to uh, independent to be independent during the 19th century. This is a very different process when we compare to Africa and when we compare to Asia. And from those differences, different conflicts emerge. Different conflicts emerge. I'd like to stress this to you. We're not, uh, uh, I'm not my intention is not to cover all the history of Latin America, but we don't have time to do that and it's not our objective. But instead of that, I'd like to stress some ideas that has to do with the process of independence of Latin America. I, so we can see the first country that uh, was able to, to be independent was Haiti, was Haiti. Uh, then Paraguay, then Argentina, then Chile, Venezuela, Colombia, the same date, same year, not the same date, but the same year, Mexico, Ecuador, the same year, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, and the last one, Cuba, in the, in the last part of the 19th century. So when the 20th century began, began most of the uh, Latin American countries were already independent. That made a lot of difference in many, let's say, in many situations, in many circumstances that we can analyze uh, afterwards. Important also to stress uh, the relevance of the, what we call in Spanish, los próceres, los próceres. Uh, the founding fathers. The translation is not uh, exactly the same, but we used to translate Los Proceres as founding fathers because the founding fathers in the United States of America, they, they had a different role there. More, I would say, intellectual in the conception of the nation. And in the case of Latin America, the Proceres were more related to the independence process in terms of military, military and the, the beginning of the nation state building. It's inevitable that we mention Simon Bolivar, El Libertador, 
because Simon Bolivar is still today a reference and an inspiration for many countries. When you talk about Venezuela, for instance, when you talk about Chavez and Maduro, when you see pictures with Maduro, we, we also see uh, a picture from the Libertador in, in his back, always. So Simon Bolivar and Libertador had an important role in the independence of many countries in South America. And also San Martin, who was an Argentinian, he was very important, in, not only in the Argentina independence, but also in other countries in South America. Both are very important references, but of course that Simon Bolivar is much more because uh, he is a reference also still today for uh, some of the political leadership in, in the region, in, in, especially in South America. We could talk about many other processes. In Brazil, we called Patriarca, the, the Patriarca, the founding father of the Brazilian independence was José Bonifácio. But the, the objective was not to be exhaustive here on this is only to take this idea of the importance of the process, the founding fathers. In many of the Latin American countries, uh, I would say that in Brazil less, because Brazil has less memory of this period, but in other Latin American countries, especially in the Hispanic countries from, from the tradition, Hispanic tradition, the processes are still there as important references for the, uh, the sovereignty of those countries. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit more now about the political conflicts in Latin America uh, regarding the word, uh, the word periods, uh, the word main periods that we can uh, categorize, we can classify uh, word periods in which political conflicts have happened uh, under a certain political boundary. Uh, during the 19th century, we had the nation building process, as we, we saw the independence process took place for Latin America and the Caribbean during the 19th century. So those countries began the national, the nation building process at that point. And what happened with the nation building process? Genocide against native population, a huge genocide against native population. The genocide was not only when the Spaniards and the Portuguese arrived during the 16th century, but it happened all the centuries ahead from the, the beginning of the conquest. Uh, in Argentina, for instance, uh, the, the genocide was so huge that the few indigenous peoples remain in, in Argentina and the same in other countries. Uh, so this was an important thing. And today there is a historical revision try to recover the memory of those peoples that suffered genocide, the indigenous peoples, including because we have still indigenous peoples alive and we would like that they could survive to other kinds of exploitation. Uh, we also had border definitions because it was not easy to define what were the borders between different countries. Um, Bolivar, Simon Bolivar, he defended a great nation. He called that the Patria Grande, uh, but it was not possible to keep the Patria Grande in, in South America or in Latin America. So it was uh, the, the region fragmented in different countries. So there was an important task to delimitate borders. The limitations were made by, it was an interstate uh, inter action between states, but in many cases we had wars to the, uh, regarding the limitation. It was an, uh, not an, uh, an agreement on the limitation and, and, and we saw uh, wars happen. It was, for instance, the US-Mexico war, 
in, in, in the case of Mexico, Mexico lost one third of its territory for the US. It was a huge loss for the Mexico. And this explains a lot of uh, political actions today in Mexico towards the US, but it's not part of our analysis here. Uh, the Pacific War between Chile and Bolivia and uh, Peru uh, regarding territory, not only uh, dry territory, but also sea, the, the ocean territory, and also the Bolivia-Paraguay War, which was more recent. Uh, many of those, or all those wars, they are not, this is not an exhaustive list, but those wars were uh, due to the delimitation uh, process that was not agreed to the countries. One important thing to mention here, and we can, we can come back to this point uh, during the questions and comments, is that uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, we, we have a very different process of uh, peaceful delimitation of borders. We have in Brazil uh, a personality called uh, Baron of Rio Branco, Baron do Rio Branco, who was a very prominent diplomat, and he was able to delimitate the borders of Brazil through arbitrage and to uh, negotiations. It was a very particular way to delimitate borders, but didn't apply to other countries in Latin America. Then we had the Cold War period, or more or less more than four decades of Cold War. The bipolarity began in 1947 with the beginning of the confrontation between the US and the, the Western uh, Bloc and the Soviet Union and the East Bloc, the East-West conflict uh, do, uh, between 1947 and 1989 when the, the Berlin Wall fall. Uh, okay, during the Cold War period, we had a kind of conflict that were uh, under the bipolarity. And Latin America suffered a lot with that because uh, Latin American countries were uh, pressured to be aligned to the US and against the Soviet Union, but not all the countries were against the Soviet Union. And the main example was Cuba. Cuba was the main example until today. It, uh, Cuba was able to preserve its position, uh, not to be aligned to the US. But during though this period of Cold War, Latin America had a lot of political conflicts uh, under the, the, the umbrella of the Cold War. It's important to, to be aware of that. Then we had the post-Cold War conflicts between 1989, 1989 and 2000 uh, first. And the 2001st, uh, the date is when we had the, the terrorist attacks in the US. This is the why, why we fixed this date. The post-Cold War conflicts, we had a, a huge fragmentation of the world, world system. The, the, the world system was fragmented. The, the former Yugoslavia was a, a, a main example of the fragmentation of the uh, many countries that had place during this period. Then we had the war on terrorist conflicts during this period between 2001 and 2016. And I put the, the date 2016 because that date was the date that Trump was elected in the US. And this was a landmark, uh, landmark situation, not only for the US, but also for other countries in the world. And then we have today the contemporary period we have some trends uh, related, to, related to organized crime, political bipolarization, a new world order, uh, a working process of a new world order, and climate change. Now, I would like to begin to discuss with you some of, in, some of the indicators that we could use to identify where political conflicts in Latin America are, where they are located. One of the indicators 
which is not, uh, let's say, so scientific, so scientific, but is relevant still, is the Nobel Peace Prize laureates. As we all know, the Nobel Peace uh, Prizes awards every year uh, a prize for a group, for an individual, or for a group of individuals, for, or for an institution that uh, has had an important contribution to peace. When you see the list of the Nobel Peace Prize, and you can check this in the, in the, the website of the Nobel Peace Foundation, we see five laureates from Latin America, five. The first was Carlos Saavedra Lamas from Argentina in 1936. And these phrases I took from the, from the Nobel Foundation as it, it was there. Uh, for his role as father of the Argentina anti war pact of 1933, which he also used as a means to mediate peace between Paraguay and Bolivia in 1935. So Carlos Saavedra Lamas was the first Latin American to receive a peace, uh, the peace prize from uh, the Nobel Prize in, from, in Norway. And then we have Adolfo Pérez Esquivel in Argentina, another in Argentina, in 1998. Why Adolfo Pérez Esquivel received the, the Nobel Peace Award? Because he was a defender against dictatorship, against civil military authoritarianism, especially in Argentina, but not also in Argentina, not only Argentina, in many countries in Latin America. At that point in 1980, we had dictatorships in Brazil, in Chile, in Bolivia, in Paraguay, in Uruguay. So the Nobel Peace Prize was... Uh, given to him as a symbolic message uh, for, uh, to, uh, as an award for whom was resistant against dictatorship. Uh, and the phrase is for being a source of inspiration to repressive people, especially in Latin America. Then in 1987, we have Oscar Arias Sanchez from Costa Rica, Oscar Arias Sanchez, was uh, president from the Liberation National Party, and he was uh, he acted as mediator in the conflict in Central America because at that time Central America had a lot of different uh, crises. Most of them are civil wars uh, in Nicaragua with the Contras. Uh, we had the Guatemala, the guerrillas. In El Salvador, with the Frente Farabundo Marti de Libertação Nacional, in El Salvador, we had uh, in Honduras. So Central America was in a very difficult situation. And Oscar Ares Sanchez presented himself uh, as a fresh president to uh, contribute to a peace process which were, was successful. There was two accords, Esquipulas I, Esquipulas II. It was uh, signed. Uh, and Oscar Arias then received the, the Nobel Peace Prize for that, uh, for his work for lasting peace in Central America. Then we had 1992, Rigoberta Menchu from Guatemala. And then for the first time, the Nobel Foundation uh, was focusing on a situation of the indigenous peoples in the region. And Rigoberta Menchu was awarded for her struggle for social justice and ethnocultural cultural reconciliation based on respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, she's from Guatemala, which was uh, which is a country which a huge indigenous people's population, more than 60% are indigenous uh, in Guatemala. Uh, and uh, it's uh, she was an example of uh, resistance of indigenous people resistance against the oppression, against uh, the occupation of, uh, especially from the Europe and US um, and machinery, capitalist machinery of occupation. And finally, more recently, we had the peace uh, prize to Juan Manuel Santos from Colombia in 2016. And this is uh, part of one of the conflicts that we still may uh, analyze in our session uh, for his resolute efforts to bring the countries more than 50 year long civil war to an end. 
but the conflict is not ended already. The conflict is still there. What what Juan Manuel Santos did, and of course that he was very successful on that and uh, deserved the, the prize, that he was able to sign an agreement with the FARC. It's one of the Colombian army groups uh, that was active at that point. And the huge group was FARC. And so the, the accord, the agreement, it's a very complex agreement, very complex. There are a lot of chapters that are still implemented. And uh, we, we will talk about that um, following this because it's part of our presentation in the final, in the follow-up part, part of the session. But just to give you this picture of Latin America awarded by the Nobel Peace Prize. Then, we can see, uh, we can also see, um, based on the International Crisis Group, which is a very important uh, NGO uh, devoted to identify and to support international crises all over the world, not only Latin America, but all over the world. But I took a picture, very, very recent picture, you, you can check in the website of the International Crisis Group, uh, from only from Latin America and Caribbean to see which countries are under this conception that they have in the international crisis group of, of a crisis, of a political crisis. Then you can see countries, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. So. Uh, under the, the umbrella of the International Crisis Group uh, analysis uh, actions, there are those countries. But it, what is important to stress is that there are very huge differences between those countries in terms of conflicts, political conflicts. Uh, and most of the, if you can, if you, if you take Brazil as an example, in the case of Brazil, the situation changed a lot from January to today, because until January, until December 31st, we have a government, a far right government of uh, President Bolsonaro, which was a government against, in many cases, against human rights, against democracy, uh, against uh, a democratic electoral process and many other situations that I could uh, illustrate for you. But from January to today, and we hope that this can prevail uh, in the future, uh, we have a different country in terms of the role of the state. Now the state is protecting human rights, is protecting democracy. So, we cannot say that Brazil in the international crisis group picture is the same Brazil uh, four months ago and the same now, this is a different country. But we can say that in the case of Colombia, in the case of Haiti, in the case of Mexico, in the case of Nicaragua and Venezuela is the same country because they still have the same kind of, co of conflicts, political conflicts that they used to have in the last years. So this is a way that we have to find out where are the political conflicts in, in a certain region. We are talking about Latin America. So when you see the international crisis group picture, we can see with a very close, I would say, uh, it's very close the, of the reality, uh, we, we can identify where are the main political crises in, in the region, in, the case, in this case, Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, it's important to, uh, to be clear about the definitions of conflicts. You already received, before the, the course began and also during the course, you, have you, you already received some definitions of uh, key words of key expressions regarding peace, regarding conflicts. But I'd like to be 
uh, to go into more detail with you now, uh, talking about violent and nonviolent conflicts. Conflict itself is not a, a bad thing. We have to live with conflicts. Conflict is part of life. And we have to, to learn how to manage conflicts in our personal lives, uh, between countries, among countries. The problem is when the conflict become a violent one. And this is the problem. This is what we have to, uh, to prevent. That's why I have to resolve when a conflict become a violent conflict. And when you talk about violent conflicts, we also uh, can uh, make a difference between violent conflicts without arms and with arm. So we have when you see an armed conflict, uh, it's different when you see a conflict which is violent but without arm. So armed conflicts are the worst kind of conflicts we have. And that's why we have a lot of research uh, in universities, in the global north, and in the global south, trying to understand and to identify uh, the armed conflicts uh, among countries. And when we talk about armed conflicts, we also should be very aware what kind of conflicts we're talking about. One kind is the interstate conflict interstate armed conflict between states. Uh, what we, we have been, we, we have some interstate conflicts, armed conflicts in the world, but at this point, we don't have in Latin America any kind of interstate conflict, which is armed conflict. This is a region that uh, in, this, in this sense, the region is peaceful, because uh, we don't have an interstate uh, war uh, in the region, interregion. Then we have the interstate conflict. And the interstate conflict could also be an armed conflict. Then we have the civil wars, the civil wars. And in the case of Latin America, yes, we have. We have Colombia, an armed conflict in Colombia is still there because the, the peace accords were only, was, uh, were only with one group, which was the most important one, but not the only one. There are others uh, acting in Colombia. And we also have some kind of armed conflict that happens uh, in uh, groups that are not belligerent as the international law categorizes, but they are armed conflicts acting, uh, um, pursuing their own interests in terms of uh, defending uh, some territory, uh, defending some resources, uh, disputing political uh, influence, and so on and so forth. Uh, another classification that is important to mention is the, that is, uh, there are state-based conflicts and non-state-based conflicts. The state-based conflicts, when the state is involved in, 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 at some point, that could be interstate or that could be interstate. But the state, if the state is not part of the conflict, this is a non-state-based conflict. We can see, for instance, religious conflicts between different religious groups that the state is not part of the conflict. It happens in some, in some situations. Uh, um, and also we have national and international conflicts. Some civil wars could be classified as national wars and others not. For instance, Syria, the Syria conflict began as a national civil war and then evolved as an international civil war or an international war because of the influence of different countries in the war in Syria. Okay. Then, uh, now I'd like to show you in this slide and the next, um, a, a methodology, a specific methodology um, 
under which we can identify and we can analyze conflicts and also political conflicts in, in Latin America. The definition of army conflict that the Uppsala conflict data uh, project uh, offers to us uh, is, is a definition, uh, uh, this definition relates to state-based conflict. <clears throat> and then the states, the definition states, a state-based armed conflict is a contested incompatibility that concerns government and or territory where the use of armed forces between two parties or which at least one is the government of a state results in at least 25 battle-related deaths in one calendar year. So this is a discretionary way to put boundaries in a methodology to say, this is an army conflict, this is not an army conflict. And what is the Uppsala uh, conflict data uh, project did, and it's a very important one, very important, including, including the, this uh, data project is a source for the international crisis uh, group, for the reports of the international crisis group. They use this source and other countries, other governments use also this source to, to identify when we have a conflict, when we don't have a conflict. So if a certain uh, conflict results in at least 25 battle-related deaths in one calendar, we can call that a conflict, an army conflict. Uh, at, at this point, I'm not sure if you can realize uh, that this methodology uh, allows us to classify many conflicts that we use not to consider an armed conflict. Because you used to consider an armed conflict as a normal perception, the interstate conflict between countries and huge civil wars. But when you talk about organized crime, urban violence, we use not to relate army conflict with those conflicts, but the, the Uppsala uh, conflict data project allows us to do that. So let's take the, the, the next slide. Maybe it will be more clear to you what we are talking about. When you see Latin America and the Caribbean, it's a very recent date, 2021, you can see those circles in the map of the Latin America map, and you can see above number of deaths, 2021st. And you can see uh, that uh, we have in the left side, uh, 120,000 and 60, 4,800 deaths by the year 2021. Going to the map, you can see a lot of circles in Brazil, a lot of circles in Brazil, a circle in Venezuela, a circle in Col two circles in Colombia, one circle uh, in Haiti, in the Caribbean, four circles in Mexico. What does do represent? What does it represent? Uh, we, through the Uppsala conflict data project lens, we can assure that we have army conflict in those countries because you have more or at least 25 battle uh, resulting in, in deaths uh, on, 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 on that spots, you can see the map. This makes the analysis of political conflicts, if you talk, if you are talking about armed conflict, much more broader than we used to, to do in, uh, if we, we, can, we can mention international relations, discipline, we can mention political science, sociology, anthropology, and also other fields, uh, that are interested in, in conflicts, psychology, and, and so on and so forth. So this methodology is important for us to understand why we can identify, analyze, and classify 
army conflicts in Latin America, not only if we have a civil war or interstate war, but also if we have a certain level of deaths during a year, based on the Uppsala project. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the responsibility to protect principle, uh, focusing, focusing on in Latin America. Maybe most of you are not familiar with this principle. Uh, this principle was officially um, approved during the United Nations World Summit document outcome in 2005. And there is a definition of what is responsibility to protect. It is not a norm yet. It's, uh, let's say, there is a process of um, an emerging norm uh, in the international uh, scenario. It is not a officially a norm because many countries does not, do, do not uh, recognize as a norm and international law uh, is based on uh, widespread recognition of norms and it's not the case for R2P, but R2P, uh, as we, we, can, we can say the responsibility to protect as uh, its acronym, R2P, um, is an important way to approach political conflicts in different countries. So what is R2P? Each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. This res responsibility entails the prevention of such crimes, including the incitement through appropriate and necessary means. We accept that responsibility and we will and we'll act in accordance with it. The international community should as appropriate, encourage and help states to exercise this responsibility and support the United Nations in establishing an early warning capacity. If we take Latin America and the Caribbean, and I offer to you one of the sources of our session was a text on responsibility to protect Latin America that I had the opportunity to write for a book in 2012 in a book uh, that was edited by um, an American, a Canadian, and had the preface of Desmond Tutu and Vaclav Havel, the, the, the former president of the uh, Czech Republic. In this book, uh, in this chapter, I try to analyze how the responsibility to protect could be applied in Latin America and which countries were in favor, which countries were against. There was an exercise of uh, analysis at that moment. Of course, that from that period to now, many things changed. But I consider that the main uh, analysis uh, is already updated uh, to today because uh, there was uh, different uh, situations uh, that is, are still in the, in, the, in the territory, different situations, political situations that are still under our analysis in the region. So indigenous peoples are under attack. Indigenous peoples are under attack. Uh, many political groups are under attack, especially after the bipolarization in Brazil with Bolsonaro, for instance. Those political groups and those indigenous peoples were in many cases were not uh, favored by the state protection. So they were under attack and, they, and they, we could conceive it that uh, the responsibility to protect could be applied in those cases. And there are two countries specifically that the responsibility to protect could be applied at this very moment, Haiti and Venezuela. Not by coincidence, those countries uh, are not um, uh, are under supervision uh, of the United Nations system and, and the regional organization systems. Uh, okay, when you talk about early warning, prevention, management, conflict resolution, peace building, uh, those are actions 
that the international uh, the international system and uh, the countries in international relations are very concerned about that those uh, actions and but the international organizations in general especially the UN they have the mandate to perform those actions so we can we can mention for instance the UN Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs of the UN the UNCR the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights the United, United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees the International Organization of Migrants of Migration the UNDP uh, regarding development and democracy, the CEPAL regarding the ECOSOC, and also it's important to mention the civil society organizations like Red Cross, Crisis Group, and many universities. Here in this map, we can see very updated, uh, we can see uh, the United Nations Special Political Missions and other political presence from the UN, the map is uh, of this year or the last year. And in Latin America, we see two U UN missions, permanent ones, one in Haiti, other in Colombia. You may ask why we don't have a mission in Venezuela, if Venezuela is a hot spot in terms of political conflict, because the Venezuela government did not allow to have. This is the, 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 the point, because the UN only be in the territory, could be in the territory of a country if the country allows, if the government allows. It is not the case of Venezuela, but this is the case of Haiti, is the case of Colombia. We also have, in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, it's very important to mention, we also have regional organizations. We have the hemispheric ones, we, we can also, uh, call them the Pan-American ones, the Organization of American States, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, uh, the Inter-American Human Rights Court, and the Inter-American Development Bank. They are all part of the Inter-American system, which, which has a lot of roles, important ones, regarding political conflicts in the region. We also have CELAC, which is the Latin American Countries um, Council, which is more recent. Um, we have South America, in South America, we have UNASUR, which is now recovering. Uh, Brazil uh, went back to UNASUR and now tried to be recovered with Chile, with Venezuela and Argentina. Uh, we have the Andean Pact, which is a very well-established agreement between uh, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, uh, Venezuela, countries of the Indian region. And also we have Mercosur, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay uh, as uh, founder members and also Venezuela, but Venezuela is not part at this point. Central America, we have the SICA, the Central American Integration System, and the Caribbean, the Caribbean we have the CARICOM. As you can see, all the, re the region and the sub-regions, they have their specifically their uh, organizations. And each of these organizations has some uh, mechanism of political conflict management. Now, I'd like to present you a list. The list is not exhaustive, is an exemplative, uh, uh, is an example. And also we can put other <laughs> situations of conflict here in other countries in different issues. But I think we can understand, we can, uh, we can maybe we can better understand uh, political conflicts in Latin America when you see this list and the diversity of the list. Narcotraffic drug cartels. We can mention Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela as the main countries where those cartels operate. They operate there. Civil war we have in Colombia. Democracy instability. Well, many countries has different levels of democracy instability, but Peru is now the most important one. We have uh, recently an impeachment of a uh, president. We have many protests in, in urban environment uh, in Peru. So I think it's important to, to mention Peru in this, in this issue. Then we have authoritarian regimes, authoritarian regimes or, or autocratic regimes. Well, we can, we can use different language to identify those regimes. Venezuela, Nicaragua, 
Cuba é o Salvador. They are different ways of autocratic, in different ways. El Salvador was elected uh, the last election, uh, but you know we know that Cuba not. Nicaragua is a persistent Sandinista regime, and Venezuela, we know that Maduro succeeded Chavez and is still there. We have also vulnerable states. I don't like to use um, uh, failed states. I, I, can, I can clarify to you why I don't use failed states to, to classify this. I prefer vulnerable states to classify. Haiti, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, where we can see gangs, the Maras in, in those countries, and makes the state very vulnerable. Humanitarian crisis in Haiti, Venezuela, conflict for access to natural strategic resources, widespread. We, had, we see this conflict in many countries, if not in all countries, inequalities, conflicts, widespread too, if not in all countries. This is another indicator to see where we can find political conflicts in the, in the region. This is a comparative statistics, statistics of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This statistic is 2021. You can see the blue, uh, the blue level uh, where the blue level is higher, you can see that there are more of uh, uh, petitions uh, against violations of human rights received in the commission, in the, in the Human Rights Commission. One thing that I'd like to stress to you, because it's a tricky uh, issue, is uh, the fact that uh, Colombia is the first country where we can find the, mo the, 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 the highest level of uh, uh, petitions received, then Mexico, then Peru, then Argentina, then Brazil. This is not, uh, let's say, an, an, an absolute uh, statistic because this is, um, a, I consider a tricky uh, issue because in the case of Colombia, in the case of Mexico, the civil society on those countries are very well prepared to petition, to, to, to fill petitions in the human rights system. In other countries like Brazil, where we have a lot of violation of human rights, civil society in Brazil are not well are not so well prepared as is the civil society in Argentina, Mexico, and and Colombia uh, at this point. So, in other terms, maybe there could be more petitions against Brazil than in reality we have, because we don't have. The, the civil society so well prepared to prepare the cases and to fill petitions under the uh, human rights system. Okay, but in any case, this statistic can show us something that in Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Brazil, in this, uh, uh, in this sequence, we can find a lot, a lot of human rights violations, which, uh, can show us that we have a political conflict in those societies. Okay, we have the map of Venezuela. I will go more faster, Dr. Glossa, to, to conclude my presentation here. Uh, only two slides on Venezuela. This slide is based on the response for Venezuela, R4V. Uh, is a platform that show us updates information on the Venezuela political, economic, and humanitarian crisis. Then you can see Venezuelan refugees and migrants in the world, seven um, million, 239,000 Venezuelan all over the world. But from this number, six, six million are in Latin America. It's a huge number. Venezuela is one of the five countries that produces uh, the, uh, more refugees in the world today. Here we can see the evolution of the figures in the response for Venezuela in 17 countries. Colombia is the country which receives most of the Venezuelans, then Peru, then Ecuador, then Chile, then Brazil, then Argentina, then Panama. But if you see the number of Colombian the number of Venezuelans, the Venezuelans that are in Colombia is a huge number. It's 2,400,000 people there. 
this is important to reflect about the burden of each country in the in the in the borders of Venezuela receiving those. I I I, I am talking about burden. I not I don't consider there is a burden, but the burden is the language of the Geneva Convention of Refugees. The burden to receive. And in the International Criminal Court, there are two cases under development only from Venezuela, Latin America. There, there are some claims against Bolsonaro, but they are not still as cases. They are, they are claims, but not cases. But cases, we only have Venezuela. So Venezuela is an important case in the International Criminal Court a court that investigates crimes against genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. Finally, and to conclude, or to almost conclude, we have to see uh, the support for democracy in Latin America is declining. This is bad, these are bad news for the, for the region because if the support for democracy is declining, it means that autocratic regimes will take place, unfortunately. And we have been seeing this in Brazil happening, in other countries too. In, in, in El Salvador, for instance, is another example uh, recent. You see, the, uh, this, the, the dates are between 1995 and 2018. But the other uh, slide maybe is more contundent, is more strong. Democracy is preferred form of government. The line is declining. Satisfied with democracy, the line is declining. This is a source of Latino barometer too, the source, but uh, reproduced by the economist. Okay, outcomes to conclude now. Outcomes of political conflicts in Latin America. We have as, as, as an outcome, forced migration, urban protests, rural protests, urban violence, urban rural militias, autocratic regimes elected, imposed, mass violation of human rights, lack of state control over territories and army conflicts. Those are also, uh, some of them could be sources, but many, maybe all, could be also outcomes. And to conclude our presentation, I, I go back to our question, what is Latin America? Our beginning question. This is a map uh, of the Uruguayan artist Torres Garcia from 1943, when he put the, the map and the other way to, to, to uh, and he assured, he assured that the, our north is the south. It's only to reflect about that. Thank you very much for your attention, for your patience. And I am at your disposal for comments and, and answers to your questions. Thank you very much. The main way that we as uh, countries, we uh, take in consideration that law and order would be the, the main way to face the, the, the problems of uh, sustainability of democracy, the main way that we have is through protection of human rights. So the states have the primary uh, responsibility to protect those citizens, uh, nationals or migrants, uh, it's not depending on nationality, all the population, under uh, that is in a territory of state uh, deserves protection from the state from violations of their human rights. And you are talking uh, uh, about human rights in a very huge and a very wide uh, perspective, civil, political, social, economic uh, uh, rights in, in many ways. So for that, we have the, the institutions of the, the very state but also we have international institutions, institutions that are uh, that works. The those institutions work to protect human rights, like the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights, the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, in terms of hemispheric uh, protection, 
and uh, but uh, those institutions uh, only they only act when the state fails when the state fails because the state should protect those citizens that are under uh, its jurisdiction in the territory so we have to beg in human rights uh, if a state if a government do, uh, does not follow human rights then the international institutions can act and can prevail under a, a compromise under a commitment to uh, to the state to those uh, institutions If you are talking about Petro's government, and I think your question uh, goes to, to that, to him, I think he is uh, doing serious work uh, to, to make, uh, to, first, to implement the peace accords. Because in Colombia, we have to be aware that we have two different processes. One is the implementation of the peace accords from 26. 2016. This, this implementation is not easy. It's under process. Uh, it was blocked by different groups, including parliamentary groups, and, and also militias were not uh, in favor of the, those accords because they are very complex. They have to be with the compensation to victims. They have to be with the agrarian reform. It's a very complex, very comprehensive agreement. This is one process. The other process has to do with the negotiation with the uh, Liberation Army, uh, National Liberation Army, the uh, Ejército Libertación Nacional, because it's another negotiation. There is no agreement yet, and there are other countries, there are uh, other third parties involved, like Cuba, like Norway that are part of Mexico, that are part of those, uh, including Brazil. Brazil is also participating, not in this process, but the, the process of implementation of the, the, the peace agreement. So to, to answer you directly, I believe personally that this government is serious about the implementation. Who are not serious? Some of part of the society, the Colombian society are not serious about the implementation because the, 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 the agreement maybe and, and probably is against their interests. Well, your question is not an easy question to answer because one thing is what we hope. The other thing is what would we as analysts with some, let's say, realism uh, would like to, uh, we analyze the conflict or the conflicts. And then based on those analyses, we can project the future, no? Uh, we, we are talking about science, not we're not talking about provision, esoteric provision. I talk about science. When you talk about science, we have some already answers to say we can prevent conflicts, we can resolve conflicts. What do we need in Latin America to do that? We need an agrarian reform in most of the countries. We need Diminish the, to diminish the level of inequality, the Gini indicator, which a few people have a lot of rich richness and uh, most people have nothing. So this situation is un, un, unsustainable and in the long in the long run. So we have to uh, the role of the Inter-American Development Bank. The role of the financial, of the, the state financial banks, like in the case of Brazil, the BNDES, the National Development and Social Bank, are exactly to finance development, to diminish the level of political conflict, which source 
uh, are based on the inequalities we have in the region. Those inequalities began there in the conquest. We are not talking about a recent one. We are talking about a persistent inequality. And we have cleavage of, race, of racial and ethnic problems. People who are uh, black people in Brazil, uh, people who are, who are Afro-descendants suffers much more, and not only in Brazil, in other countries, than others which, who are white ones. Women suffers more than men. We have different soci societal cleavages that uh, affect the political conflicts. But uh, in the case of our region, I would say that if we could be successful, not to one country, not to two countries, but the region as, as a whole, to face the inequalities, the social economic inequalities, we would be more, we will have more hope and less concern about what would be our future in that. This is one answer. And the, and the other answer, I think it's very important to mention, is climate change. Because climate change is another source of conflict that is affecting all, of, all over the world, but Latin America uh, is one of the, the, the regions that will be very affected to that, is, is already affected. The Caribbean region, we, ha we already has a, a, a huge budget of the Inter-American Development Bank to mitigate the impacts of climate change in islands, the Caribbean islands, and the coasts of many countries that will displace the people. And most of those people displaced will be poor people, people without land, people without home. So what we could expect from that? Political conflicts, of course. Those people will be not be silent, will not be uh, comfortable in those situations. So we have a huge challenge in our region, but the good news is that we have already the, the diagnosis for that. We have some money to that, but unfortunately we don't have, I would say, a smart elite to put those plans in, 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 in the territory. In, in, in to implement those data. So the people should be aware that they, they should vote. And in my opinion, sorry, I have to, to give you my opinion. We have to vote in persons, in parties that are concerned with the, the poorest, the vulnerable, not other interests. Uh, about Haiti. Haiti is going back to our political conflict map and uh, uh, we already have some negotiations uh, taking place between countries. For instance, when President Lula went to the White House to talk to President Biden, uh, we know that one of the issues that were, were discussed was a possible participation of Brazil in a new mission to Haiti. Uh, but we, we think that Brazil uh, refused to, to be the chief command of the, this mission that will be discussed in the United Nations the Security Council because the Security Council should approve this mission. But, and the Canada government uh, now is <laughs> under consultation to see if the Canada will be the, the, the head of this mission. But we don't know if, if President Lula will agree to send soldiers, to send military to a new mission. But I confess to you that I don't believe that a new mission will resolve the problem in Haiti. The problem in Haiti is a socioeconomic problem that the very uh, great powers like the US is part of the problem. It has to do with trade. It has to do with the development. There are other things. Of course, that we have a problem now, a urgent problem of gangs in Haiti. We don't, we don't refuse to see that. And this, the people are under attack. The responsibility to protect is there. They could be applied there. But we have to think how to manage that without 
uh, do the same mistake we did in the Minusta, for instance. In the Minusta, well, the Minusta, we can we can talk, we can assure that the Minusta was the whole was a whole mistake. Maybe some things were uh, were good there, but others not. So to repeat the mistakes, we cannot because then we'll be only to to make a, a UN machinery machinery to to work. Uh, it, this is not the, the objective, I think. I am so disappointed as you are, I think, uh, at this point with Haiti and the and all this all these uh, negotiations to a new peacekeeping force there. Your point. I think it's very difficult to 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 answer and also to comment because what we could say about that, Mexico failed. Mexico is failing to combat um, to combat the narco traffic using military, using military. The the uh, the option of Mexico was to put the military. And together with the civil police to combat narco traffic. Now, what happened to the military in Mexico? Corrupted, was corrupted by the narco, narco traffic. Of course, that is a very simple way to, to, to say what is happening in Mexico. It is a very complex situation. And I would like not only, I, 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 I don't want to be simplistic in my analysis, but one lesson learned from Mexico and also from Colombia because Colombia began, then was Mexico, is to invoke military in this combat. It's very dangerous to do that. So we have to think in another way to combat narco traffic with police, not with military. Because if the military uh, would be corrupted by narco traffic, then the security of the state is under attack in, in, many, in many ways. And uh, you are right when you say that even countries where the cartels are not operating, they are affected by the, the by the narco traffic in the cartels. Ecuador, Ecuador is uh, um, a question mark. <laughs> we don't know what will happen to Ecuador uh, because, well, maybe the different thing from Ecuador to Peru, because we're comparing both, is that in Ecuador, we have a, a more clear leadership. This is Rafael Correa, the former president. Rafael Correa is now uh, presenting himself as, uh, again, as a leadership. Uh, he was uh, indicted, uh, he was uh, criminalized during a period. Now he was presenting himself as a leader. You don't see a leadership in Peru. Of course, that we have Fujimori, uh, Keiko Fujimori, but she is a far right leadership and she, she doesn't have a sufficient support from the Peruvian society. Of, uh, luckily, I, I would say, luckily. But in the case of, of Ecuador, we have a more stable, I would say, leadership that in the future could manage this situation. Though, so I don't see Ecuador and Peru at the same level in terms of instability. I think Peru is more unstable than Ecuador. Uh, 